Welcome to What's Up Pasadena. On this episode, we find the perfect place to meet some furry friends. We go on guard at Swords Fencing Studio. We head to Pasadena Comic Con for some animated fun. We learn about an organization giving previously incarcerated individuals a second chance at life. And we discover amazing vintage finds at the Pasadena City College Flea Market. Tailtown Cats, we are a cat cafe and rescue adoption lounge. Today we have fosters up front with their kitties from Kitten Rescue of Los Angeles that live in their house. And then inside the lounge, we have over 35 cats from Kitten Rescue of Los Angeles that are here to find their homes. So we have members of the public who are coming in to meet cats, potentially adopt some kitties, or just hang out and relax. Our founder, Carol, started Tailtown Cats with her daughter um, as a family run business and they were really inspired by the Japanese cat cafes. They started to pick up in the United States and a lot of them are predominantly rescue based and they were just looking for ways that they could help and give back to the rescue community and help get cats adopted. So they were fostering cats on their own and then fostered through Kitten Rescue and adopted from Kitten Rescue. So they had a relationship and then it just all came to came to being. So the, the first time I came here, I walked in and, and saw the lounge and just thought it looked like Disneyland for cats and wanted to get some of my foster kitties in here because it seemed so fun. Um, and I knew they would love it. For me, it's also been great to come here and meet other fosters and other you know kitty rescue people and and have them really become my network both in terms of support uh, but then also in terms of advice today i brought rory he's a three-year-old male he's an orange tabby and white and he was rescued from a high kill shelter i also brought mystique and her daughter magic they're a mom and a 10 month old and then a kitty bellini who was found on the street hungry our goal is really to get cats adopted, but give them a really positive, um, enriched environment. So giving them a lot of space to move around, breaking them out of the traditional shelter kennels, giving them exercise and soft blankets and comfy beds and toys where they can run around and they can play with each other because cats are incredibly social creatures. So when people ask like, how can I make my cat cuddly? It is by putting cuddles into your cat. Your cat gives you back what you put into them. I think Tailtown is unique. Um, certainly setting it apart from shelters or other sort of cat rescue adoption opportunities is that you know the cats are walking around, they're, they're acting more like they would in a home environment. And so you get a better sense of their personality and, and what they're gonna be like if you adopt them. And then in terms of kind of comparing it to other cat cafes that I've uh, scoped out, I think you know the kitties here are really friendly. Um, the volunteers and the staff spend a lot of time trying to make sure that the cats are socialized and comfortable. And so it really does have this sort of like calm, happy environment. So we have a variety of events here at Tailtown Cats. We try to take a little more fun, quirky, a little crazy angle to things. So we have, you know, of course our adoption events, which get p potential adopters in the door, but we also have trivia. That's a rotating theme every month. It's different. We do monthly bingo. We have meow and paint events. That's a guided art event where you get your canvas and your paints, everything set up for you. And it's a step-by-step -step process to do like a really fun, different themes again, seasonal holidays. We did Cat Festivus a couple years ago where members of the community got to log on and vote for their favorite cat with their uh, cranky grievances that they had to air for <laughs> for the holiday season. Last year we did our catnip court where you got to vote for essentially your favorite beauty queen <laughs> cat. Um, and then the winning kitty was crowned by the Tournament of Roses Queens um, from the Tournament of Roses Parade Pasadena. So that was really great. So we have rotating events. We have our core events and then we have seasonal events as well. 
So we have two kitties who are going home today to their forever homes. We have Anime. She's a little white domestic short hair kitty who was rescued from the streets of Pasadena. And then Yoda came through Kitten Rescue through one of their community fosters. And he's a little brown tabby, kind of a little bulldog of a cat. <laughs> so he's going home today as well. You don't have to be looking to adopt a cat to come. You just have to like cats. Um, so you can come in, work, hang out. That helps the cats because it helps to socialize them, get them used to people, get them used to new people. Um, so even that is great. Um, and as I said, there are lots of fun events, lots of different things you can do. And then also, you know, Tailtown is largely run, managed, taken care of by volunteers. Um, so if anyone is interested in like a more formal, um, you know, or ongoing opportunity, those definitely exist. Whether it's our stories, the warmth of our laugh, or our family's secret sauce, we all bring something different to the table. So make some space. The power of connection is waiting right outside your comfort zone. Learn how you can help strengthen your community at belongingbeginswithus.org slash team up. We're here at Swords Fencing Studio. We started in 1997. Our goal pretty much is to teach kids fencing and be competitive. Fencing is a great sport for kids and adults because it teaches us control over our bodies and it's a lot of cardio and it's a lot of explosive kind of speed and, and, and movements like that. So it really helps you be in control of your body and, and get a lot stronger in a, in a very natural way. Fencing started as a sort of the old Three Musketeers kind of dueling, that kind of stuff. And then they really started to dial in the rules and the do's and don'ts. And it also started Sabre, which is much more slashing and different rules, like you're not allowed to cross your legs. That originated from Sabres on horseback, that kind of thing. It kind of comes from all different places and you pull rules around and here we are today. There are three weapons in fencing. There's foil, epee, and sabre. We here at Swords, we teach epee. And epe is pretty simple. I can hit you anywhere on the body. You can hit me anywhere on the body. First person to hit the other person gets a point. First round, it's first to five points. You fence everybody in a small group of five to seven people. Second round is direct elimination. It's a bracket, and it's first to 15 points, and it's last one standing. In epe, the tip is a little button. If I hit you like this, it's a point. It's not slashing, it's not anywhere on the body, it's just a little button. So the strips here are basically the bounds that we're supposed to stay in. The two closest lines are the on-guard lines, that's where you start. The two lines that aren't at the end quite yet are the warning lines, that's just to let you know you're getting close to the end of the strip. The end of the strip is once you step off that with both feet, other person gets a point. There's really no need to be intimidated when you step in here. We have a bunch of different classes. You can do private lessons, so it's just one-on-one -on -one with a coach. And then there's the group classes, which we range from beginner all the way to advanced, competing internationally, those kinds of kids. So we have a wide range of skill levels for all. For the first month or so, I'd say you don't have to buy any gear, really. We supply it. That first sort of learning phase, just learning the basic steps, the basic actions, things like that, everything is supplied here. If you really want to get invested, really want to be competing, that kind of thing, you're going to have to get your own set of gear and, and invest then. When it comes to emotions, especially with kids growing up, they're kind of all over the place, especially in their early teens. It gets kind of crazy. When you're competing and you're really trying to hone that skill, the emotional side comes into play as well, and you really have to learn how to control that. And you learn really early on how to keep control of your emotions, how to keep control of your body, things like that. So I'd, I'd say it's, that's a, definitely a plus for kids. My mom got me into fencing, actually. She realized that I was, I was really shy, and her kind of idea was, well, he's wearing a mask, so he's not gonna be looking his opponent in the eye, and he likes Star Wars with the lightsaber fighting and that kind of thing. So I got, I started that way, and then kind of what kept me in it was I realized I was really competitive. My first tournament, I lost a ton, I didn't, I don't think I won a single match. And then I like literally kept all my stuff on. I was crying, I walked into the car, I got in the car. By the time we got home, 
I had stopped crying and my mom tells the story the best story. She just heard me from the back of the car go like, all right, when's the next tournament? Like, and she was like, all right, we're roped in. <laughs> so that was kind of the start, yeah. I was a former Team USA member for cadet, which is basically high school level. Traveled internationally to a lot of World Cups and things like that. It's top three in the country. I was nearing that level. Now I'm here as a coach, taking a break from college, that kind of stuff. We're a group of really, really competitive coaches. We've got quite a pedigree. Our head coach started me when I was eight, so I've got quite a history here. We started a long time ago, and really our goal was just to just to make it to world championships or Olympics or any, any kind of big thing like that. That was what we shot for, and we're still trying to do that today. The impact of a meal goes well beyond feeding our bodies. Because when people are fed, futures are nourished. And with your help, together we can end hunger. Join the movement at feedingamerica.org slash act now. This is Pasadena Comic Con, Pasadena, California, and we have one of the best, friendliest events in town. It's a pop culture event with guests from all over. It's everybody, everything, cosplay, gaming, uh, animation, voice actors, special guests, and it's really just kind of to hit every nail you could have to come out here and have a good time. I think with any Comic Con, cosplay is an important part of the show and we definitely encourage everybody to come out in costume as much as you want. In 2020, I started getting into cosplaying. I like that everybody feels comfortable just being themselves and expressing their interests and their creativity, um, sharing those things with other people. We're all just here to have a great time, so the vibe is always amazing. When I was growing up, I did martial arts, and it was actually the Power Rangers that got me really interested in doing martial arts. I think mostly it's about just expressing yourself in a society that kind of likes to box people in or pigeonhole them into a certain thing. It's nice to come to events like this where you can choose whatever you want to be and express yourself however you want. I would say that's probably the major goal, just to feel free. It's really wonderful to be able to put on a costume and become somebody different. It's kind of like acting, but I get to take it off at the end of the day. Nobody has to recognize me, so it's nice. I get a lot of my fabric from a creative reuse place called Remainders in Pasadena, and I love them so much. They take donations, they take all kinds of stuff, and they sell it, and then they take that money and they give it back to the community. If people want to begin making cosplay, uh, a simple sewing machine or a hot glue gun would be a great place to start. First try to start small if you can, because if you start with something big and bulky, like immediately, you might not get used to it immediately and your body's obviously gonna turn against you. Every artist, uh, we suffer for our craft <laughs> pretty much, but it's a good suffering in many things. Mashika is my Aztec princess, so that's in my princess series, the Princess Academia of the Majestics. And she has a cute like pet ocelot, she has an axolotl as well. So it is from us American times, but it's a princess story that I created myself. And she gets told three riddles she has to solve with her pets. You know, take a little bit of history here and there, make a fun story for all ages. So what got me into storytelling is just the, the desire to say a good story that we haven't seen before. It's like, I grew up, I didn't see anybody that really looks like me on screen. Unfortunately, right? Like we had really cool, female, but no Latinas, like where is a Latina superhero? A Latina, you know, saving the day, saving the world, etc. And like, so that's something that me as a writer can bring to the forefront and say, hey, you do exist. Hey, you are important. Just being seen and here's a good story where we're not the bad person, right? We're always the bad person. We're always a negative stereotype. Otherwise, we just need so many more stories out there being told. They brought in comics called a Comic-Con and it's gotten bigger and better every year. So I bring my vintage inventory. And I've been doing pretty well. I think I sold a couple of big books the first day I did the show three years ago. And we're talking about five-figure books. We were affected where prices and demand skyrocketed. And it did not hold. Even I'm over the top on a couple of giant books. And it's back to what I feel is pre-pandemic pricing, which means we're at a slower trickle value upward. So we've leveled off. 
So it is a buyer's market and everybody's starting to realize that they can get in with some equity. I started buying comics when I was about six years old. I would run around the neighborhood on my skateboard or bicycle and try to find comics in people's garages. By the time I was about 10 or 12 years old, I was nuts about comics. Well, I walked into a guy's closet and he was buying for 50 cents and selling for a dollar and he had them all. And I saw that closet when I was 12 and I never forgot. And I went to that same closet 17 years later and I bought them for a dollar a piece. Spider-Man one and up. I sat down in 1990 and told Stan Lee that story in person. And he says, my Brad, that's the Immaculate Collection. The truth is passion pays. I am blessed to have my original collection and have it be worth, instead of a dollar, maybe a million dollars. And then knowing that I still get the same joy about pouring over the condition, the art. I collect artists. I love it all. Well, I'm here at the 2024 Pasadena Comic Con. Out here at the Pasadena Convention Center. And it's awesome! There's so many wonderful people. Like, we're in this great corner. We've got SpongeBob SquarePants over there. We've got the legendary Butch Patrick over there. The even more legendary Sid Croft. There's all kinds of great people. I think Sam Jones from uh, Flash Gordon's around here somewhere. A lot of really great people in the industry, but a lot of great artists. It's all for the fans. I don't know if you know me or not from a show called Yo Gabba Gabba. But that was a kid's show that ran on Nickelodeon for quite some time. And now all these kids are growing up and the parents come back here with their kids. And so, you know, they're like, you created a lot of memories for us and we want to thank you. So I'm just happy to be out here to interact with all these people. And yeah, they just want to say thank you. And I want to say thank you back to them. We're really happy so many people came out this year to Pasadena Comic-Con. Next year will be January 26th, my birthday, here at the Pasadena Convention Center. So see you guys next year. When we first met Todd, he was singing a song, and I was like, wow, look at this kid with the biggest smile. Todd's a joy. Yes. Todd's sir. really is a great joy. And you. Learn about adopting a teen at adoptuskids.org. Flint Rich Center is a nonprofit organization in Pasadena. Our mission is to break cycles of poverty, violence, and incarceration. So to that end, we provide programs that prevent or divert youth from entering the justice system, as well as programs that support adults returning home from incarceration. So Flint Rich Center provides three different programs. One is the Youth of Promise program which supports youth ages 11 through 18. We work with Pasadena Unified School District schools as well as local law enforcement agencies to create a pathway to supportive services for youth who may have come into contact with law enforcement agencies uh, or youth who may be on the verge of, of dropping out of school. And we connect them with a robust kind of network of supportive services through after school and, and weekend-based programming. For adult community members who are returning home from incarceration, we provide a network of what we call reintegration services that connects individuals with any type of resource designed to meet their needs. Folks may come to us in need a, of housing support, substance use support, counseling, or, or perhaps employment. So we work with a wide network of partners to do that. Our third program that we provide on site is our most intensive program. It's the Apprenticeship Preparation Program, which prepares previously incarcerated individuals for union construction careers. So in 2008, we started our first cohort of the Apprenticeship Preparation Program, and we are now facilitating our 46th cohort. We have 27 individuals who will be graduating on Thursday, April 4th. The Apprenticeship Preparation Program is a 10-week, 240-hour program about 120 hours of the program are dedicated to a union-developed curriculum. It's called the Multi-Craft Core Curriculum. It exposes individuals to all kinds of trades in construction, so that means carpenters, laborers, plumbers. And upon completing this curriculum, folks actually get a certificate from the unions, which makes them very competitive for union apprenticeships. The remaining 120 hours of the program are dedicated to soft skills, things like 
employment development. We do trauma-informed life skills through our partner organization, Second Call. Uh, we do mock interviews and resume writing. We also take individuals to active construction sites, to union training facilities, and expose them to small hands-on projects like building little free libraries for the community. I've been a lead instructor for approximately eight cohorts here. I myself graduated here from Flint Ridge back in 2016. Once they come into the class, uh, they, they feel, have to unlearn some things. They have to get up, we have physical training, they have to get acclimated with a classroom environment. And once they get in, they love it. You get a hands-on, they become family, they just feed off each other, motivate each other. The apprenticeship preparation program is very much designed to be a cohort model, meaning that it creates opportunities for participants to connect with instructors, a network of supportive services, but also with each other and also with the community. So there is lots of opportunity for, for fun, for team building. We sometimes take folks on hikes just to get them out into the community. Our hands-on projects, like the little free libraries I mentioned, are designed to create connectivity with the community that they're in. Working with my hands is one thing that I love, and I got to do a library house doing my resume. I was struggling with it and they helped me, you know, like I had different people come up to me like, hey, you got this, do you need help? And I admired that. Flint Ridge works were formerly incarcerated and construction is one of the only, let's say, trades that does not hold you accountable for what you have done. You know, sometimes people make mistakes. It's not a, a life sentence and it gives people an opportunity and a second chance to support their families. So we teach everyone here that, hey, all you gotta do is just reach out and grab it. Flint Ridge, we feel, has been very successful in both preventing youth from entering the justice system as well as preventing previous incarcerated adults from returning. So for the Youth of Promise, the youth that we work with, roughly 90% of those individuals, again, who maybe have been referred by law enforcement agency, do not end up in the juvenile justice system. For previous incarcerated adults, our recidivism rate, that's the return to incarceration rate, is less than 15% for all the adults that we serve, which is about 300 or so annually. For participants of our apprenticeship preparation program, uh, the recidivism rate of individual participants is 10%. And these numbers are compared to in California and Los Angeles County, where that figure is close to 50%. I'm excited for this new chapter in my life because, you know, I'm going to have a career. It's not just a job and I'm excited to do something that I love to do. There's people that are struggling and I know I did. And so I wish that, you know, I knew about this program a long time ago because I would probably be, you know, where I want to be, where I'm looking forward to be now. I probably would have been done that. But I think the best experience that I'm having right now is the opportunity to pass it along and let them know, hey, I've been in your shoes. All you have to do is go ahead and apply yourself and trust in the process, and Flint Ridge has the recipe to get that done. Hi, I'm Smokey Bear, and I made an assistant to help you prevent wildfires. Dude, I've got this. I've been camping since I was five years old. But I am a camping influencer. You know what, I'll bet you five bucks. Okay. Assistant Smokey, what is the best way to put out a campfire? Mm -hmm. To put out a campfire, drown with water, stir, drown again, then make sure the fire is out cold by feeling with the back of your hand. Wait, really? I'll take the five bucks. Pasadena City College Flea Market is a family-friendly market. We're also a pet-friendly market. As long as you bring your furry friends in a leash, they're welcome to come. And we have two beautiful outdoor lots, and we have one indoor parking structure with two levels. So it makes it so nice for customers. If it's too sunny outside, they go outside first and cool off inside a little bit. And then um, we do have lot five, which is a parking structure. We are very unique when it gets to a vintage market. We're strictly antique, vintage, and collectible market. Junk that our vendors call, um, or antique and collectibles, but customers love it and they want to have it. We do allow some vendors that have um, certain items, handcrafted items, approved by mostly me as a coordinator, because I want to make sure that we keep our motto of having an antique, vintage, collectible market. 
we're a nonprofit, so whatever we gain from profits, it goes back to our student body population, our student programs at Pasadena City College. And we created the Flea Market uh, Volunteerism Scholarship, the Flea Market Leadership Scholarship, and we have one big scholarship, which is the uh, Flea Market Entrepreneurship Scholarship. And Pasadena City College Flea Market has always focused on hiring students. And that's how the flea market all started. Back in 1977, it was actually two student government twin members, Tom and Tim Selinski, and they didn't get any additional stipend or pay for their hard work as student leaders. So as business students, they were able to create what we call now the Pasadena City College Flea Market. From 10 vendors, we now have more than 450 vendors at our market each month, but we only have two vendors at our market that have been here since the first 1977 event. They love the market and they bring family members, helpers, and they do this because they love the flea market. Some vendors are unique, like our uh, vendor that sells just crystal. We have a vendor that, that's a tool guy and everybody knows who the tool guy is. So the, he always brings tools, but we do have some vendors that sometimes they'll bring just vintage jewelry, but the next month they bring, you know, different items. And this is what makes our customers come back because they understand that the market changes and that vendors bring other items that were not here last month. And every vendor is different. Every vendor has their story. They all sell different items. So you start falling in love with the market and it's very hard to leave. Level three, going to lot four, that's where you're gonna see all the records. And it's a record swap, so it is a community. We don't mix and match antique or vintage collectibles there, and they will let us know if we put a vendor that's selling antiques there. Um, like I said, it's a very also tight community in the vinyl record world. I'm a vendor at the PCC flea market. I've been out here since the early 90s. I've seen it through all the different locations. It's moved almost to every parking lot. We've used to set up tents. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of vinyl here. This is what I've done for 40 years. I go all over the world and so does this guy. This is the place to come. It's been around forever and it's great. People from all over the world come here. It's known everywhere I've been in Europe. I go, oh, I go to the Pasadena flea market. If you get here early enough and you dig hard enough, you can find good stuff for next to nothing. Most importantly, Pasadena City College flea market is free entry. So uh, you can't beat free, can you, Mike? If you paid me to come, I'd <laughs> probably. <laughs> the only thing I, su I suggest to all of you folks who want to come here is cash is king. Come here with your cash. If you want to negotiate, don't be late. Bring your cash. It always speaks volumes. Yeah. This place is always awesome because we do obviously a lot of the antique shows. But this is special because you have the unique buyers that really are interested in really buying unique stuff. This is one of my favorite antique markets in North America. Our markets are the first Sunday of the month. Our operation hours are from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And if you haven't been here before, Pasadena City College Flea Market will not disappoint you. We love vintage and Pasadena, California!